Okay, we're Mr. live now. Michael. Okay, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, we are uh, a few minutes behind time. Uh, we're just trying to get our other technology thing going. Uh, so welcome. Tonight we want to welcome everybody to I'm trying to tag. Okay, we'll do that later. Anyway, good evening, everybody. And we have a few of us here in the church. And uh, for those who are at home, uh, if you do need the handout, our notes uh, for the series, just uh, indicate in the comment section, and we will get that sent out to you tomorrow, uh, God willing. But uh, tonight, we're just going to start with the introduction to our new Bible study series. Uh, uh, titled Self-Care, Self-Help, and Self-Love. Uh, it's going to be a practical, uh, interactive Bible study for every one of us. And uh, together we'll be learning as we go, uh, just trusting the Lord to speak to us and to unveil the truth that will bring uh, healing to you and to me spiritually, emotionally, and otherwise. Amen. So, without any um, further uh, introduction, let us pray as we go into our study tonight. Uh, intelligent Holy Spirit, we just thank you for being so kind and gracious. We thank you for this new season. We thank you for the beginning of our new Bible study for the new year, 2021. We commit everything that we're going to be doing into your hand because you are the greatest teacher. We depend on you to lead us into the truth, through the word that will bring healing and deliverance to us. We cover those who are at home and those of us here with the blood of Jesus. And we ask that the voice of the blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel will speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And so our first scripture uh, is uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 to 28. Is there anybody that has that that would like to read out loud? Matthew chapter 23. We, as we begin our study tonight. Matthew chapter 23. Verse 25 to 28, the three verses. Is anybody willing to read that loud? Matthew 23, what? Verse 25 to 28. Okay. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make Sipo <laughs> curl. Indeed, appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Amen. Thank you. Right. Right, okay, uh, for those of you at home, it's Matthew chapter 23, verse 25 to 28. Uh, the reason why uh, this first scripture is our theme, uh, when it comes to self-care and self-love, one of the deception that we fall into is trying to look good on the outside, while inside we are burning. You know, especially in the body of Christ, we have people who... You know, we have, we have a way of dressing up things, right? We are bleeding inside like a wounded dog, but on the outside, we pretend, you know, because, you know, you have this phrase that people always say, why don't you try to look better? It doesn't matter whether you're better, but just try to look the part. 
right? And we grow up with that kind of mentality, uh, pretending and hiding our true feelings. So this is why we're reading one of the first scriptures. We're going to be looking at that as we go back into inner healing that will bring that self-care, self-love. You know, because we need to first of all go back inside to bring out what is uh, uh, outside, you know, amen. And so the second test we're reading tonight is uh, uh, 10 John verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It's on your hand out there. Right? He said, I want you to prosper. Let your uh, outward prosperity be in proportion to your inner prosperity. Right? Because if your soul is not prosperous, if your soul is not settled, if your soul is not at rest, whatever is happening on the outside is just a facade. This is why somebody can be a billionaire and have all the fancy cars and big house, and the next day you hear they just kill themselves, right? You know, so God said, no, I want you to have a balanced lifestyle, you know, as a spiritual being. And this is what is lacking today with all that is happening. David also made us to understand in Psalm 139, you know, he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He said, you have knitted me from within. He said, this my soul know it. You know, because if the soul is not at rest, if the soul is not prosperous, whatever kind of outward success that you have is just going to be temporal. It's just a matter of time before things begin to blow out of proportion. Amen. So God is so concerned about that. And then Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40. So for those at home, for the sake of uh, tomorrow, uh, next week, we'll have all the PA system so that when people read, you can hear them. So for the benefit of the people at home, I'm going to try to read this too so that everybody can be. Matthew chapter 22, verse 20, uh, 36 to 40. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. You see again, the soul. And with all thy mind. This is the, great, this is the first and great commandment. 39. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Right? Love the Lord with all your soul. That means it takes a healthy person spiritually to love. And if I'm not able to love God with all my soul, I can't love me. And if I don't love me, I can't love my neighbor. Because I said, these are the two, the greatest commandment. Now, he said, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. And so before I can love you, I should start with me. Because I cannot give what I don't have. You know, you cannot, uh, like the team here, is that it is difficult for you to pour from an empty cup. If the cup is empty, if I say that they encourage, and this is serious, get me water to drink from the kettle. <laughs> Now, if I ask for water and you bring me an empty cup, have you helped me in any way? And a lot of people today who are trying to minister and trying to help people try to give water, but they are empty inside. And so instead of helping people, they end up hurting them. And this is why, especially with all that is happening now, everybody is running on empty. But we are also trying to pretend to be this uh, bionic men and women, supermen. And we are running on empty, but we're still trying to be caregivers. And that is not the way God has designed us to be. Right? And so he said, love, thank you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if I can't love me, I can't love you. Huh? Amen. So this is very, very important. 
So look uh, into your handout now as we go uh, quickly. It, uh, self care means I care enough about myself to help myself out of my emotional rot. Right? And, and this also goes for, especially women. You know, uh, a lot of, uh, I want, <laughs> I was going to say a lot of us, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> And I want to say a lot of us women are like, <laughs> but you know, mostly, uh, especially women, mothers can relate to this. You know, they are bleeding, but they still, you know, they're taking care of their family out of a place of exhaustion and tiredness, emotionally and physically. You know, they're just this bionic super women who are not even allowed to feel pain. They are not allowed to cry. You know, uh, my late mom used to say this to us. She said, even a mother too can die. You know, because the way people treat the mothers is as if they are not capable of any pain or experiencing any kind of hurt, right? A, a mother will go hungry so that her children can have something to eat, right? And she will act and, you know, she will put up and act as if everything is okay. But deep down inside, all is not well, right? And this is, uh, it's not a healthy place sometimes. And after a while, people just hit the rock. And so, so that's what it means. Uh, Self-care means I care enough about myself to help myself out of my emotional rock. Self-help means I love myself enough to want to take care of me so I can take care of you, right? Because if I don't take care of me, I can't take care of you. Because if we are both broken, have you ever experienced two broken people in a relationship? Have you ever seen that? It's horrible to look at, right? Okay. Self-care will give birth to self-help. Self-help happens because I discovered that God loves me and he wants me to love me so I can love my neighbor in a wholesome and healthy way. You see, this is the, this is the, the merry-go-round, the spiritual circle that God wants us, right? God pours into me, right? And when I receive the love of God, I'm able to pour into my sister, into my brother, into my children in a very healthy way. Now, if I have not received that healthy love injected into my heart by the Holy Spirit, then I'm not capable of giving healthy love. The reason why people abuse each other in relationship is a place because they are dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional in a way, all right? And so this is what we're trying to break. And this is just the introduction to the series we're going to be dealing with in the coming weeks. And so the question for our dialogue tonight is, why do people neglect themselves emotionally? Now it's open for... If you take your mask off, so you can talk over here. Yeah, no. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Why? <laughs> thank you. Because we don't love ourselves enough. Yeah, because we don't love ourselves, yeah. And what, what could be the cause of me not loving myself? Because everybody... You know, the, the other part of it is that everybody's crying for love. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody's looking for somebody to love them for who they are, what they are. And these people that are looking for people to love them for who they are and what they are, don't even love themselves for who they are and what they are. <laughs> right, yeah. should be able to be who they are. Right. Right. Okay. Right. 
Right. We've always been taught. Yeah, we've always been. Yeah, and that's a very good point there because everybody is uh, perceived to be trained to be a martyr, kind of. You know, you want to be a hero. Everybody wants to go uh, on mission to South America, to India, to Africa, to go and save the world. You know what I mean? But if I try to save me, I will be considered selfish and somehow the, the word put a spin on it. Could that be one of the reasons? Because like you said, we've not been taught to take care of ourselves because if I begin to think about me in a certain way, people think that I'm too proud, I'm too full of myself, I don't care about anybody, I'm so self-centered, I'm selfish. And so because of that, the fear of trying to do that, Right. And, and the enemy sure likes to attack on those emotions. So, yeah. And I think that's a lot to do with why sometimes we do get emotional. Right. Things go on because it's who you are on the inside. All the things going on right now. Anybody else? Is it also possible? Who was, somebody was saying something? No. I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it possible also that, is it also possible that because of uh, my background, somebody's upbringing, like you said, okay, in a way, okay, I've been taught not to take care of myself. What about the flip side where they've made me think that I'm not worth anything, that I don't deserve, Right? They make me, the, my atmosphere, my family background, my social background could create that impression in my mind by the way people treat me that I don't deserve anything better from life in a way. So why should I even care? This is the way, you know, they can push that impression to me just the same way, like our sister said, we've been taught not to take care of ourselves, care for ourselves, but care for others. Right? Now, the next question we have for our discourse is on your hand. Are emotionally neglected individuals capable of loving and caring? Huh? <laughs> Huh? Everyone is capable. Yeah. Right. So even when. Yeah? I think they're capable of loving and caring because that's what they're wanting. Right. They want that love. They want the care of love. Right. Because if uh, it, 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 you can't think they are, they are yearning for that, but they don't have it because really you can't have what you don't, you can't give what you don't have, right? Because uh, emotionally neglected, starved, broken person is so needy, right? They're so needy, they're so needy that they are not capable of giving, even if they want to. It's not in them. And so a, a healing has to take place for them to be able to realize that this is what, that, that this is my thought also, right? Okay. Self-love is self-discovery of who I am in Christ Jesus. Self-love is the knowledge that God loves me, not because of what I have done or did not do. And we, I will tell you why this is important. We're going there. Self-love happens when I discover my true identity in Christ Jesus, that God so loved me enough to die for me on the cross, 
Self-love happens when I accept by faith what the Lord did for me on the cross of Calvary. Now, because if I don't know that, right, because it, it, it is that healing that brings about the wholeness. You know, like the question for us, today, how do I go about discovering who I am in Christ? Because when I am emotionally broken, emotionally destroyed, uh, it could be as a result of abuse mentally, physically. It could be as a result of neglect, parental lack of love, growing up, uh, being bullied, being mentally and physically abused and all that. And so it is hard for me to come to grasp with the reality. Because what we're talking about here, we're not talking about the people outside. We're talking about those in the body of Christ now, people who are church going. Right? We say praise the Lord on Sunday, but we go back home and we cry ourselves to tears. We still feel empty. You remember the story of the woman uh, in the gospel when Jesus saw her? The Bible says she was bent over, but she could in no wise lift up herself. The Bible didn't say she couldn't lift others up, but she was incapable of helping herself. And what did Jesus do? You know, because Jesus reached to her and touch her, you know, because the brokenness inside of her, the rejection that that person felt needed some deep level of affirmation. And Jesus had to do that. Right? And so how do we go about discovering who we are in Christ? Because if somebody comes to me in the mall now, let me rephrase it. And you meet somebody and you say, oh, uh, why don't you, uh, you know, your life is so messed up. Why don't you let Jesus, why don't you let Jesus love you? Why don't you experience the love of God? Is that not what we try to tell people? And the person says, okay, how do I go about that? <laughs> Read the word. Read the word. Yeah. Read the word. You no, know, how do I go about discovering who I am in Christ? That's a question. Huh? Yeah. And, and that, uh, all that is a, uh, are all fundamentals and an ongoing, but I think the key part and the ultimate key to discovering the love of God for me is in the Word of God. Like uh, Brother said, it's in the Word of God. Because if I, I need to go, because every time you, let me put it this way, when you buy a uh, any kind of electronics, for instance, whatever you buy today comes with an owner manual, right? And before you can operate it, they'll tell you to read the manual. Um, 90% of us, we don't. We don't read, the, you, you know what I mean? We don't read the manual. And so, uh, because we don't go through the manual, because it's too long, we don't read the fine print. 
And I remember telling you a story, I read it in the Daily Bread a few years ago, and uh, there's this traveling agent that have their fine print, I think it's about how many pages, over like half a book like, the other, like that, right? But in between it, halfway through the instruction, they put it there that anybody who read, who went through the whole thing, will get uh, how many, uh, a few thousand dollars, about 10,000 or something reward. And for years, nobody saw that. <laughs> because nobody reads it. Until this lady, she's, everybody call her spooky, nerd, you know that kind of people. You know, before she does anything, she, if it is a hundred page, she will sit down and go through everything before she signed. And then lo and behold, she came across that. And she, for how many years, since that company was set up, she was the first person that won that. And, and that reminds me of many of us Christians, right? We don't open our Bible. So how would we know the mind of God for ourselves? How do we know what God says about us? All right? We come to church and, oh, the, the preacher will preach and read. We don't even, it, it, it's so bad in today's world that most people, too, don't even cross-check even what, if whatever the pastor is saying is right. You're not saying the pastor is bad. You know what I mean. But people don't even have the time to go check. Okay, what my pastor said today. Does it really line up with the word? You can't even know that because you don't even know the word. And so for self-discovery and to know the love of God for yourself, I think the sum total is that if I don't have the word of God, David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart. And Paul said, let this word of Christ dwell in you and me richly. And so for us to discover who we are in Christ, we have to go back to the owner's manual, which is your Bible. And then the other act of people's love and kindness will just come to complement that. Right? Because if I don't know God's word, okay, let me give you another example why it's important to know the word of God. Uh, there's a story, I don't know how true it is, uh, in um, what do you call it? Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, I'll, re I'll just quote it for you. I beseech you by the message of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, right? Which is holy and acceptable unto God. Now, uh, a young lady, this is how the story went. Uh, a young lady went to the pastor and uh, the pastor said, okay, and read the scripture to her and say, oh, the Bible says you should present your body as a living sacrifice to me. Now, because if, if you don't know the Bible and know the word of God and know who God is, in ignorance, you will believe that. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? And this is why it's important that we must, for us to know who we are and whose we are, we cannot negate the word of God. That should be our foundation. We must study to show ourselves approved at all times. And so that when people come to show us love, if it is not genuine, we will know. That's when it is through the love of God, through studying of the scripture and spending time with God in prayer and the word that the Holy Spirit begins to show you and give you the spirit of discernment. So when somebody is talking, oh, no, 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 no. It may sound very cool, but you say, no, there's something not clicking here. Amen. All right. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, or whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why do people find it hard to love themselves? And what is keeping people from accepting the free love of God? Right. And who they are, and what they either become, or maybe a path that they've gone down where they they know that they're on the wrong path or not doing right, and so they they don't love themselves because they know the predicament they're in, whatever it is. They don't. 
they're, they're not, even they are not accepting their position. Hmm. And so what keeps people also from accepting the love of God that is free? Right. Uh huh. A thought, like you know, like you mentioned the instruction, like um, we can stay in the instruction for a long time, but there's living too, and a lifestyle, uh, just in, in like a lifestyle as far as our well-being, just uh, exercise properly, eating properly, and being neglect any one of those, and we say gain weight or we don't feel good. We're not going to feel good about ourselves. And the same thing with living for God. Like, uh, it's with us all the time. We don't pick it up and drop it. We live that word as we walk through life. You know, we go, like you said, to the mall or where. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, some of us are young Christians, some of us are Christians all our life. And, uh, we need to develop that lifestyle. And also, that we carry that with us. And the second question here is, what is keeping people from accepting the free love of God? And I think the word there, the catch there is the free. And I answer that it's free. And a lot of people are too proud to accept anything that is free. It's not going to cost them anything. You know, how do you mean, what do you mean as you just uh, confess my sin and God will just love me? I don't have to do anything. He, you know, it's hard. I'm too bad. It's too, my life is so messed up that, no, no, nothing can, you know, God can love me. No, I'm not capable of that. God can, you know, no. And the same people, if you tell them, okay, oh, for you to feel love, I want you to go to the uh, the Grand Mountain and stand there with one leg for two hours, lifting up your hands like that. You will give them something bizarre to do. They will believe that more, right? Or wake up at 12 midnight and walk to Grand Cash Lake and spin about seven times. <laughs> you, know, you know, if there's no cash to it, they don't want it because uh, the gospel is too simple. In most cases, it's to, what do you mean just believe, right? The way we've been conditioned, we always feel as if we have to do something. Right. We have to earn it. Yeah. Think, yeah that's, so people always think, how can you just be free? Like, we're talking about salvation and yeah. heaven. How can you just say, me just saying, Jesus, come into my heart, and that's it. It's done. So it's because of the human uh, way we see things. We were conditioned. Right. Because of the world we live in, we always assume that we have to earn it. We have to do something in order to have it. Yeah. All right. Amen. All right. So self-care is learning to treat yourself well. Because people will always treat you the way you treat yourself. The value you place on yourself is the value people will place on you. Right? And this is very important. And that's why we cannot divorce this from the Word of God. Remember, having self-esteem and self-worth is not a sign of pride. Rather, it is a sign of one who is settled in who they are and whose they are in Christ Jesus. This is very, very important. And that is what creates the balance. You know what I mean? You know, because when you know who you are and whose you are, you don't settle for mediocrity. You don't just settle for anything. You know, you, you are able to put boundaries. You are able to do things. You, you know what I mean? There, there's a balance. And only Christ can give that. And so the opposite of self-love will be self-hate. Self-hate, self-loathness is evident in our lives when the joy of the Lord is completely absent in our lives. Self-loathing is extreme criticism of oneself. You know, people who are very critical of you, just don't worry about it. I just realized that they are even worse to themselves. <laughs> Do you understand? You know, people who criticize people a lot, don't worry about them. Honestly, this is the truth. 
you find that people with a critical spirit, you, uh, instead of you getting angry at them, feel sorry for them because they are even worse to themselves. They need help, right? And so when you, some of this understanding that brings healing to you, so instead of you getting all worked up emotionally over what somebody said to you, you know, now the flip side of you being a healthy person, you look at that person, you look at them with pity because you just can imagine what they're going through inside. You know, they'll look at you and they say, oh, this your dress is good, but it's, it's just that because you've added so much <laughs> You know, they never end, they don't end the story well. They really find something to pin you down. You know, that's a, so, it may feel as though nothing you do is good enough or that you are unworthy. You see, people with a critical self loathing spirit or undeserving of anything good in life, this is what makes people perform empty. Now, people who have self-hate, that hate themselves. Now, can you imagine that person being a caregiver to you? No. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. Uh, but again, do, we, do you know that we have them? You know, we put people like that in a place of leadership and responsibility, and they are hurting people all the time? I've seen, I've seen that. Right, you understand what I'm saying? You know, they hurt people with their comments, with their words, and sometimes they say they are tough. No. Right? And so this is what makes people perform empty, because they think by performing, they will be accepted and loved. And so people who have this emptiness, you know, they mask it up with performance syndrome. They're very busy doing things they want to, because they, it, they are so much in competition, not with you, but with themselves. Because, so if uh, Sister Night, if she's singing very well in the church and everybody's saying, oh, what a beautiful singer. <sighs> now I want to sing. <laughs> because I want to be accepted like her. I want to be loved like her. Oh, and then suddenly that thing goes down. Oh, this, oh, that brother, oh, he's such a prayer warrior. Everybody's going to him to pray for them. Oh, now I want to be the same thing too. Even though I'm not equipped for that, I want to keep doing. I want to outdo so that I can get that attention. You know, one cl uh, classical example is the story in the book of Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira, those two couples, right? They were empty, but they were performing in emptiness because they saw... Oh, people sold their things and gave to the church, and everybody was praising them. They didn't have what it takes to be that. That is not their ministry, right? And suddenly, they wanted to do the same thing too. <laughs> you, you know? And so, you know, people who have self-hate sometimes, they try to mask it up with so much that performance syndrome. They just want to keep doing things, just want to be in your face everywhere. People, because they, they think by doing that and people pleasing. Because they, they just need people to like them. And so they look for their self-worth in what they are and not who they are. Right? You know, people who have self-hate, who are empty inside, you know, they try to find their self-worth in what they are. You know, not who they are. You know, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a businessman, I'm a teacher, I'm a pastor. You know, it's all about what they are. And have you ever been in a quarrel with a friend who knows you very well? and look you eyeball to eyeball and say, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. Huh? When people are angry with you, that's the first question they ask you. Who do you think you are? And do you know that 95% of the time, I want you to pay attention from today, people don't answer that question. Because when you ask people, say, who do you think you are? They say, do you know me? <laughs> I'm going to deal with you. That would be the response because... No, of course, I don't know you. That's why I ask you, who are you? Right? And they'll say, oh, do you know I'm a police officer? Do you know I'm the doctor in charge here? Do you know I'm the pastor of the church? I already know that. I'm not asking, what are you? I didn't say, what are you? I say, who are you? 
And for you to know who you are, you first of all know whose you are. The identity of a being is rooted in its source. Because if you don't know whose you are, you can't know who you are. Your origin. And so, and that's why Paul said, the Lord whose I am and whom I serve. And so for you to know who you are, you need to know where you're coming from. And I say this with all apology. Uh, Bob Marley sang a song. He said, we know where we are going because we know where we're coming from. And a lot of people don't know where they're going because they don't know where they're coming from. And until you know your root, your source, which is God in Christ Jesus, you don't know. And so your identity, the definition of who you are, the sum total of who you are as a person can only be discovered through Christ. Because we are created in his image. And so we need to know that. Then our work is not in what we do, but in whose we are. So our identity is secured. So whether if you take the title away, it doesn't change who I am. <laughs> All right? So, you know, people are defined. So the moment they hold, when sometimes people, their, their identity is tied to their position, the moment that position goes, they don't know what to do with their lives anymore. All right. So, and some of these questions, uh, there are questions here where I want you to take time to answer. What I want to encourage all of us to do is that please get a file for these notes. Uh, we're going to be piling it up and it's going to become a full booklet for you. And it's something that you're going to be using to, in time to come, even to help other people. Our uh, question here is, how familiar is the above statement to you? They look for their self-worth in what they are and not who they are. Right? And we just explain that now. So we quickly go because of time. People become emotionally empty cups when they do not find the courage to draw the line and set boundaries. Right? Is that true? Right? They become, you know, if they don't... And, and, and the reason why people can't set boundaries, like we talk about this performance syndrome, right? Because I'm empty and I'm running on... But I want you to like me. I want you to accept me for focus so I don't accept everything goes. And people are very smart in that sense. And this is why a lot of people are stuck in an abusive relationship. They stuck, right? Because they keep performing. Because they don't know how to, you know, because if I stop performing, I'm not going to get the attention. I'm not going to be liked anymore. Right? The only time people are talking about me is when I'm busy cleaning the church. So even though I'm tired, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> right? And so um, before you know it, I'm running on empty because I don't know how to set boundaries. You know, I don't know how to say enough. I don't, you know, I'm afraid to say no. You know, empty cups, uh, insecure people don't know how to say no because they're so afraid of rejection and we're coming to that you know and i i said something to somebody a while ago years ago and it's talked to me and i said until you can say no to you you can't say no to me that's self-leadership so until john can look at himself and say john no you can't have this cup right and so if I can say no to me, when you come to me, I cannot say no to you. So self-discipline, that's self-leadership. And that, the ability to say no comes from a place of security. You're secured in yourself. Your anger with me is not going to push me out of my safe place just to please you. Does that make sense? Huh? I think Lincoln gave it to us to read okay. the book Boundaries. The thing that stuck out most to me was the line 
first line to say no is, thank you for understanding. Right. But at this time I can't or no. Or right. Just, but thank you for understanding. Right. So That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> then they run out of friends. Right. Right. And, 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 if you, and if you don't know how to set boundaries, you get drained. And then you begin to run on empty, you are angry, you are resentful, you go back home and you are punching the wall, you know, you, you, but the next day again, you're back on the same treadmill going through the same thing and you can, you know, I, I, you just need, you need to be healed. And so the question, so the easiest and the fastest way to a miserable and empty life is trying to live your life to please everyone. That, my friend, is a recipe for emotional disaster. Right? And this is what happened. This empty life comes out. Why do emotionally wounded people find it difficult to set boundaries in their lives and relationships? That's a question that we can meditate upon. <laughs> <laughs> and that is this one is a big one, right? And we can talk about it for hours and hours and hours. But and most of us can see the reasons, even starting from all the introduction that we've had, right? Okay, the next question here, I want to jump to that, is that why do you think insecure people have this need to be liked by everyone? It's another side of the question. Anybody wants to say uh, say anything to those two questions? Any comment? No validation. Validation. for yourself. Right. Oh, awesome. Okay, quickly now because of time. And you, uh, that's the reason why we make, I make the notes detailed like this is that so that you can have time to go through it as your, on your own uh, spare time at home and then uh, send me questions, email if you have more questions to ask on anything, we can do that. And so the goal of this Bible study for us is to trust the Holy Spirit to restore back unto us the joy of our salvation. You know, Psalm 51 verse 12 says, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. The joy of salvation is the ultimate goal of every true believer because that is what will make us complete in Christ Jesus. The joy of salvation is the outward manifestation of who we are in Christ Jesus. Salvation in sense means that is uh, salvation meaning the total package obtained for us by Christ through the finished work of the cross. So if we have obtained the total package of our salvation, it will find expression in our joyful life for all to see. Right? This is what, because the joy, the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is your strength, is my strength. Right? Joy is not happiness. Right? Happiness is temporal. Happiness is informed by external happenings. But joy is internal from inside out. You see what I'm saying? And so happiness is what empty people use to cover up their emptiness inside. And so, oh, I'm so angry right now, I go get drunk. And I'm excited for two hours. So somebody came in and, and gave me $500. Now I'm happy and I blow that up and back again to where I am. But somebody who have the joy of the Lord, he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength, meaning that I can be in tears right now, but I'm still doing. <laughs> because inside, 
there is this inner strength, there's this inner settlement, there's this inner contentment. There's this river that is flowing, even through tears. I may be angry, I may be hungry, I may be sick. Things may not be going the way I want, but when you come around me, I still exude that the presence. You know what I mean? Have you been around people, you know, you just want to be around them. And then you go to somebody's house, they have all the gold, even their washroom is made of, the, the toilet seat is gold plated, yet you don't even want to stay there for two minutes. You, you know what I mean? They have all the fancy stuff, but you don't feel nothing. And then you go meet this old man in his little shack, and you stay there for hours. Right? They have something inside. This is what we're talking about. You know, and so joy is the outward expression of what is happening inside. In John, in John chapter 19, verse 30, quickly here, just we'll do five minutes because we're behind time, and I'll go through this quickly. Jesus, when Jesus has received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head up and gave up the spirit. The Greek word there translated, it is finished. It is uh, whatever, lenisia. According to them, it means paid in full. The Greek word that was used when Jesus said it is finished on the cross means it's paid everything. And this is our salvation. Salvation is body, soul, and spirit. And this is where, when I discovered that, this is why we need the word. And so everything, you know, I was praying this afternoon and, and I said, just what I was praying and the this, this scripture just jumped into my spirit and I just couldn't stop praying. You know, and, and in Ephesians, the Bible say, you know, God, he, he gave us a deposit, a guarantee in our inheritance. You know, and I've been meditating on that. I was almost going crazy, like literally in my head. You know, I'm looking at that for the first time and God has... He deposited our inheritance and sealed it with the Holy Spirit. It's just the, it's the, so everything that I need has been deposited in, in the bank of heaven. And I'm like, wow. You know, and I began to pray and I said, Lord, I draw from that deposit. So everything, he said, he said the Holy Spirit came to, is a guarantee, that is a surety, that this thing is real. And understanding that. And so the joy of salvation means that one is walking in the fullness of God's redemptive work today. Our soul, spirit, and body. It is not all dying and going to heaven, but expressing full grace and the presence of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our life. Now, the question quickly is that, can you confidently say that you have the joy of salvation working in you as a child of God? And the second question, how do you know a Christian that has the joy of the Lord in them. You know, there's no time now to answer that, but I want you to work on that this week. We are all to be wellspring of joy to others. You cannot pour from an empty cup. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. This is what we are doing. This is where we are going. We draw with joy from the well of salvation so that we can pour out joy or salvation to others. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 12, you say, with joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, right? We draw joy so that we can give out joy. Paul says, you, 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 you comfort others with the same comfort you have received from the Holy Spirit. And so for us to be good caregivers, joy is the contentment of the heart and the outflow of a life filled and possessed by God. God willing, we'll be looking at joy in detail towards the end of this series. So quickly here, we'll just have five minutes and I'll be done. To care is to feel concern, and care is attention given, tending. To care means to feel and to be interested. So self-care includes the actions our individuals care or take for themselves, their children, their family, and others to stay fit and to maintain good physical and mental health, meet social, uh, meet social and psychological need, and to prevent illness. Illness there, 
right? Illness can be emotional, physical. When you take care of yourself, even when they tell you physically, take good care of your body. Is that not what doctors would tell us? Right? If you want to live long. And for you to have a healthy life, take care of yourself emotionally. Self-care is the ability to be able to pour out of yourself. I love this one here. Self-care is the ability to be able to pour out of yourself without draining yourself. Right? I'll read that again for those at home. Self-care is the ability to be able to pour out of yourself without draining yourself. Self-care is the ability to care for you while you are still caring for others. Self-care is the ability to give the best of yourself to others without cheating yourself of the best of you. Right? How can I balance the art of caring for myself and others without hurting myself? That's the question for you. Self-care is maintaining a healthy balance in your service to self without being selfish towards others. Now, do you agree with this statement? Yes or no? Do you think that is true? Is that true? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Self-care, self-help, and self-love starts with you taking care of yourself by reaching deep down into your inner soul that is self-eternal cleansing of what is inside of you. The questions are, do you agree with this? If we do not address the inner turmoil and the dysfunctions inside of us, no matter how much we try to clean the outside, what is inside we out, will outflow, overflow to the outside. That is why we read the first scripture, right? We need to clean. How do I go about the cleaning of my inside? Matthew 15, verse 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, and false weakness. The mess outside is a function of the mess inside. If we start cleaning the outside first, we will end up going around in circle because the inside controls what is outside. The mess outside is a function of the mess inside. Inner healing we translate to outward healing that will be evident in self-love, self-esteem, which our outward expression of a restored, emotionally healed soul. To be healthy, to be a healthy caregiver, you must be healthy yourself. How true is that statement? I think it's true. Broken and battered people are dangerous people to deal with. <laughs> emotionally toxic people cannot be good caregivers or leaders. Do you think this is true? Yes, I think so. So self-care and self-help, self-love start with self-examination and self-evaluation. Second uh, Corinthians 13 says, examine yourself and see whether you're still in the faith. Are you, are my emotional and mental wound self-inflicted? When you begin to examine yourself, these are the questions for you to address at home. You want to ask yourself, what I'm going to now, are they self-inflicted? Or is it because of my choices or somebody caused me, put me where I am today? It's very, very important we begin to know the source of our wounds for us to heal properly. Why do I attract abusers, uh, abusers and emotional bullies to my life? That is a question for you to ask yourself. Why am I always gravitating towards people who bully me and abuse me? Right? Why do I feel so needy in my life? Why do I feel this overwhelming need to be liked and accepted by everyone at all costs? Why am I so afraid of saying no to people? Why am I such a people pleaser? These are questions that you, are uh, the personal questions for you. Uh, this, uh, you, know, I know what I, you know what I mean? This is just personal, right? Go through it and deal with it and be honest with yourself. We'll begin to arrive at somewhere. Why do I have this local Messiah syndrome hanging over my head? You know what I mean by that? <laughs> the local Messiah syndrome, <laughs> right? You want to save everybody. <laughs> you know, why is that so? Why do I have that? Right? Galatians 1, 10, 4, Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Quickly here, I just want to finish this. I'll just read it through. Self-care, self-love starts with knowing and accepting that what God says in his word about me. 
It is the, uh, that, that is the absolute truth and nothing but the truth. What is hindering you from accepting the word of God for your life is the question. If self-love is properly understood, it will help you to become a selfless lover of mankind and not a selfish, self-centered individual. I can only love the people in my life in a healthy and unselfish way if I'm healthy myself. Right? So the final one, only uh, what kind of damage can unhealthy caregiver inflict on those they are helping? That is a question for you to do at home. Only emotionally healthy people can choose to love because love is a choice, not a feeling. Falling in love is good, but staying in love, irrespective of your feeling, is only for emotionally healthy and secure people. So why is it so important for me to be emotionally healthy before I can love or become a caregiver? For you can stop liking people for whatever reason, but you don't stop loving them. Amen. All right, so for those who are at home, if you want the notes, the handout, so that you can, be, uh, you can be on top of things with us and go through the questionnaire, uh, tonight is the introduction. So next week, Wednesday, again. Uh, the question is, do we start at 6.30 or 7? Which is better? What works for you guys, especially people with children? Jen and uh, Racine now, little kids. Would seven, seven still work? Seven to eight works? Or six, thirty? Huh? I don't think most of us have a lot going on. <laughs> okay. Whatever works best for you. It was like, I actually thought it might be nicer at 6.30 because my youngest is really tired by the time we get home. But other than that, it's going to be fine. So 6.30 then? Okay. I'm fine with 7 too. She's here. <laughs> so okay so thank you all for what uh coming we came in online a little bit late so we're 10 minutes behind time but thank you for watching with us hello donna uh kennedy good evening and everyone if you want the note we will send it to you if you indicate in the comment section uh so every for sake of time if you have any question uh, go through your notes. If you have any questions, just send me a personal message tomorrow or a call, and we can talk further on that. If not, God willing, we'll see you on Sunday and next week, Wednesday. For that, we just want to thank you for tonight. We thank you for this introduction. We thank you for this new series. Lord, is a new ground we are treading on and a new path we are carving. We pray, Lord, that you will lead us into our truth. We pray for wisdom. We pray for understanding. We pray your blessing upon everyone that is here tonight and online. And we ask, O oh God, that the Spirit of God will continue to lead us into all truth. That will bring healing and health to, our, to us spiritually and emotionally and otherwise. We cover tonight's lesson with the blood of Jesus. And we pray for Mr. Terry, O oh God, over the loss of his, of his father. We pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit upon him and his family. Thank you, eternal rock of ages, for another evening in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Thank you. God bless. Thank you for watching.